covered and honor for us. Uh, I think that our national affiliation uh, lends us a certain sense of, uh, of uh, achievements and significance, and uh, the Young Year Movement really does embody uh, a, a uh, real sense of, a flex, a real sense of, of our ideology and our feelings and <coughs> regarding Judaism and Zionism and all the issues that are very, very dear to the, to the Jewish people. So uh, the fact that Rabbi Lerner was here as a, uh, the executive director of the uh, National Council, executive vice president, is a very big, significant moment uh, for us as a shul. And secondly, the Rabbi Lerner himself is a world figure in, uh, in national and international politics, uh, particularly uh, and exclusively nearly for, uh, for Jewish causes. Uh, and probably the singular most active or proactive uh, leading personality uh, that I know of, of Jewish or Jewish or of Orthodox Jewish organizations <coughs> in regards to um, in regards to those issues that are significant to us, Israel and so forth, um, and uh, is in the forefront of major major battles. Uh, for, uh, for the uh, important issues of the day uh, that can't count for us as Jewish people. He's a major, major voice for us. And uh, his person, just his personage being here is of great significance. But thirdly, um, uh, I would say that the topic is, uh, is the most significant of all. I mean, uh, Jonathan Pollard has been a spot, uh, has held a spot in our hearts for ever since the incarceration over 25 years ago. Uh, I was personally proactive on it for many, many years, including a trip to Washington. Um, I have been extremely sensitive to the issue. I feel it strikes the core of Jewish law and, uh, and, uh, and strikes the core of, of, our, of the essence of our people and our beliefs. And the fact that Rabbi Lerner is involved in this is of a major importance to me, uh, which I support him wholeheartedly and want to become as proactive as I can with it as well. The fact that he's here tonight on this particular <coughs> issue simply means it's a chance for all of us to take this issue a lot more seriously and all of us to, uh, to become aware to the point of what can we do, particularly in the, uh, in the uh, view of, of halach, of Jewish law, in terms of what we should be doing. Um, and in the backdrop of a lot of inactivity of American Jews on many other issues, uh, this uh, looms large as an opportunity for us to really stand up and do what needs to be done and what Allah uh, demands of us. So with this in mind, these three points, I am pleased and honored to present to you Rabbi Mesa Well, I'm honored to be here. I say I wish my mother were here to hear your introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much for those very kind words. <coughs> I'd like to acknowledge, he's not going to like it, but Rabbi Perry, who many of you know, but I didn't realize until just shortly that he's been involved in the Pollard case before me. And he has been, he has been writing to and receiving letters from Jonathan going back to the early 90s from Marion. Mary, the prison in Marion, Illinois is probably one of the top most difficult. I got a double negative here. One of the most difficult. You know, you're there you're six floors under, you don't see the light of day, 23 hours, etc. So, acknowledge Rabbi Perry, and I told him, I will be nether being seeing Jonathan on Wednesday. Okay, I average, I was there two weeks ago, twice. I took uh, Rabbi Shlomo Avinir from Mayor Tesoro, I took somebody else, I was there before Yontif. It's, uh, <coughs> I'll get into his, at, to later I'll get into his current physical condition. All I can tell you is that his attorneys and us and myself and others, Friday morning we're busy. He has kidney stones. They did some serious, some sonogram on it, it only broke half. Uh, Friday he was not in any good shape. And they went to the infirmary in the hospital, in the prison area. They told him go home and thank God we caught the attention of the director of the Bureau of Prisons in Washington and the wardens and they reacted. 
we, we, they know we don't call too often, but we'll get that in a minute. Let me give you a little bit of what I consider Jewish leadership. Uh, we acknowledge Bishus the Rabbi, the President, the Young Israel. Thank you for inviting me. And um, what am I going to tell you? I had some good teachers who taught me to care. But let's go back simply. Vayigash Elav Yehuda. Yehuda took a step forward. And he put his life on the line. He put himself on the line. He made a difference in Jewish history. That's why we are called Yehudim. Because of this Yehuda. Right? But let me tell you a word. Let me tell you a thought that we have to go a little more. We have to go a lot more. When Yehuda, excuse me, when Yosef met Binyamin last week for the first time. <coughs> okay, so it says, Vayisa Eina Vayaras Binyamin, and he raised his eyes and he saw Binyamin Ochiv Ben Imo, the mother from his father, Vayomer, and he explained to everybody, is this your younger brother, Asher Amarta Melai? And he said, that God should be gracious to you. The next pasuk, he had to go out of the room, his compassion was around, aroused. What happened? Two minutes ago, he's having a conversation. Now he has to walk out because he's crying, his emotions. What was the conversation? What went on? So Rashi, on the spot, <coughs> tells us the following. He had a conversation. So he asked him, Yosef asked Binyamin, tell me about yourself. You'll allow me to ad lib a little bit. Tell me about yourself. Who are you? Give me your family history. So he says, I asked him, do you have any brothers? I know you have one father. Do you have any brothers from your mother? And Binyamin answered, yes. I have a brother from my mother. I don't know where he is. Do you have any kids? He says, yes. I have 10 sons. And what are their names? Bella, Bech. He gave him 10 weird names. And Yosef asked him, I don't understand. These are not common names. Where they come from? And Omalau Mativon says Rashi from the Gomorrah in, 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 where, in, where is it? It says, what are their names? Mativon Shalshemo Se'elu. What's the idea behind these names? Omalo Kula Mal Shem Ochi. They're all named for my brother, Vihat Soros Hashem and the troubles that befell him. Bella, he's called Bella because Bella means to swallow up. He was swallowed up between the nations. Becher, because he was the Bechor, the firstborn of my mother. Ashbael, because God sent him into captivity. You go further, he had to live in a foreign land. Naaman, because he was pleasant. Achi, Varosh, two other names of the sons. He was my brother and my elder. Mupim, he learned from the mouth of my father. I'm reading the Rashi. Chupim, because he didn't see my marriage. I didn't see his marriage. Aired because he went down amongst the alienations. Can you imagine the emotion that Yosef had at that moment? That's why he had to leave the room. But take a look at the other side. The Panovich Yerav, right, says, look what Binyamin did. It wasn't sufficient for Binyamin to put up a statue, a picture of Yosef on the wall. Binyamin was so involved in the issue of Yosef, he called his kids by names that every time he looks at his children, he's going to see Yosef in trouble. That's how far Binyamin went to connect to his long lost brother. Every time he'd call one of his kids, he'd know that name for Yosef and that name for Yosef. He didn't put up a plaque on the wall or a picture on the wall. He lived it. He lived the sorrows of Yosef, the troubles of Yosef on a day to day. Says the Panovich Yerov, that's what's required of us, of another Jew. We have to live his pain. We have to live his sorrow. We have to live his simcha. So with regard to Jonathan Pollard, let me tell you, 
It's not professional. It's lost its professional status a long time ago. He's my brother. I got involved in Jonathan Pollard probably 17, 18 years ago. Right? There was going to be a lecture when I, 19 years ago when I came on Young Israel, 20 years ago, I made it a point to be sure to be at every Young Israel. Can't work at system if I don't know the people. Happened to be there was an issue. <coughs> it was Young Israel on the east side, lower east side, which was convenient. Having a program, I went. I heard all these issues, all these questions. They made a lot of sense. There were no answers, but the questions made a lot of sense. So I went back to my rabbis and I said, what do I do? And they told me, your questions are better than the answers, get involved. And I want you to know, I can talk to Jonathan. I don't, I don't talk to Jonathan often. Okay, that's fine, thank you very much. I don't talk to Jonathan often. There's a phone, anybody who's been in my office has a white phone. Because from prison, today he's not in Marion, today he's in Butner, FCI Federal Correction Institute, Butner, outside Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. All right. He gets into a phone booth and he puts in whatever code it is and the computer kicks in, double checks the number he's calling is an OK number and the computer calls. Computer, one switchboard can't call another switchboard. So I have a phone in my, in my, in my office that's his phone. He, has only, he only hears the number. He doesn't call me too often because Jonathan Pollard is allowed 200 minutes a month on the phone. Ladies and gentlemen, in my house, 200 minutes doesn't last a night. <laughs> okay, he's allowed 200 minutes a month and they're not, it's not, you know, sprint, reach out or whatever it is, it's not seven cents a minute, it's a buck and a half a minute. You know, prison, they have to make some money too. In any case, I got involved, started asking questions, got involved with the family, and I went down to see him. Because at the end of the day, you know, I've been down, tw I've been down dozens of times. I'm on the visiting list, I can go down certain days, I can tell you on his phone call how he's feeling, I can look at him, they like a brother. But before we talk about the Jonathan Pollard of today, let's talk about the Jonathan Pollard of then. What happened? Okay, I'm being taped, so I know what I'm saying. Okay, Jonathan Pollard committed a crime. Jonathan will tell you, I committed a crime. I deserve to be punished for my crime. That punishment is two, four, six years. Not life, going on 26 year already. Okay, what do you do? He was in a position, he was a Navy analyst, a civilian Navy analyst. Things can giving you the simple stuff. If you have plenty of time, go on his website, www.jonathanpollard.org. You can be there for a long time. A lot of information. But the bottom line is, information crossing his desk about gas coming out of the Iraq region. Go back, Watergate, Iran Gate, you'll all put it together. And he took the information and went to his superiors and said, we've got gas in the Middle East and it's going towards the enemies of Israel. And his superiors told him, you Jews are too worried about gas. Jonathan lost extended family in the camps. This was what he was told. He didn't know what to do. How do you react? How do you react? You can't take out an ad in the New York Times because number one, then the enemies will know that the, that the Americans were not giving the Israelis the information by treaty they were obligated to give. Jonathan says, I was taught, Capitol Hill was the enemy. You don't go to Congress. They're the ones who want to cut our budget. You don't talk to them. So he did what he thought at the time was the only option. <clears throat> and that was to reach out to the Israelis and give them the information. Today he says he should have quit the service and then he could have done what he wants, right? He didn't hand out, like the, the prosecution said, a Mayflower truck worth of documents. He gave 11 drops of a briefcase. Information, no arguments. 11 drops of a briefcase. How many pieces of paper can you put in a briefcase? But the government has a different way of making calculations. 
If you take one page out of the World Book Encyclopedia, they credit you for the World Book Encyclopedia. If you take one page out of Talmud, they credit you for the whole Talmud. I wish I could get such credits. <laughs> All right, so if you took the pages and you put them into perspective of the volumes they came out of, you're right, you could have filled a Mayflower truck, but he took 11 drops. The judge admitted he was an ideologue. The couple dollars he got paid, you and I wouldn't take out the garbage. Okay? But what happened? He got caught. He, there's a story, he went to the Israeli embassy, they threw him out, we could go on and on. He, had a, he made a plea bargain. The plea bargain was, I make a deal, I cooperate, I inform you, and you give me a decent sentence. The most Jonathan could have gotten was life. If you make a plea bargain on life, what do you expect to get? Not life. Well, he had a lot of unfortunate luck. Number one, the attorney that was hired for him was of Lebanese descent. Okay, you're going to ask me why, who, what, it's a speech on its own, right? Years later, when they talked to this guy, his answer was, me? Look what you guys did to my people. When the sentence, I'm fast forwarding, when he received his life sentence, normally you fill out, I'm not an attorney, I didn't go to law school, but they tell me your first year law student knows that what you do is you go to the corner, you fill out a piece of paper, on a, a right to appeal, and you put it in the system. Jonathan's lawyer never did that. Jonathan didn't find out about that till 10 years later, or nine, eight years later when he got out of Marion, and he discovered that nobody didn't appeal. And if he didn't do the appeal sheet, it's much more difficult. Jonathan had a plea bargain. The day before, the day that morning of the sentencing, Casper Weinberger sent in a 40-page memo. Some is public, and some to this day is confidential. And the bottom line is, he basically said, in the year of the spy, remember the walkers? Remember some of the others? He set the tone. In the year of the spy, this is the worst spy. So what do you think the judge is going to do? What happened to the plea bargain? What happened to the agreement? It's gone. They whisked Jonathan away. They put him in solitary confinement for years. Solitary confinement is not like we see on TV. Right. They took him. He was in a jail naked. They took away his glasses. They gave him a cold shower. You can't imagine what he went through. Okay, all right, Perry probably has more information from his letters than I do then. And they kept asking him, let's tell us who your partners was. Who's Mr. X? Who else was doing anything in there? And he said, there was no Mr. X. Right. That's the story in short. Plea bargain. Rudy Giuliani, former mayor of New York, who was an assistant prosecuting attorney in the federal system, says you don't break a plea bargain. When you break a plea bargain, the game is over, the guy goes free. He should have gone free because they broke the plea bargain. Casper Weinberger had no right, legally, to take the executive office and move it into the judicial office. And as we stand here tonight, there's a gentleman, Dr. Lawrence Korb, a non-Jew, who was the Under Secretary of Defense under Weinberger, who's on his way now to Israel to testify in Knesset tomorrow that Weinberger was a vicious anti-Israeli, anti, uh, he doesn't say anti-Semite, anti-Israel, right? And the letter and the information was, couldn't, didn't have to be true. He hated everything about Israel. Congressman Anthony Weiner from Brooklyn Long story, had a conversation with the attorney who wrote that Weinberger memo. And he told the congressman half of it's not true, and the, half of it, and the other half was written with venom. Okay, I had breakfast on one occasion, two occasions, with former CIA director Jim Wolseley, who says, Rabbi, I saw everything. He did bad, but 20 years is enough, especially amongst friends, and this was five years ago. So when people ask me, well, what do you know? Maybe there's stuff. I said, you're right. 
But I don't have to be more religious than this head of the CIA. I don't have to be more strict than the Undersecretary of Defense. I don't have to be more strict than Senator Dennis DeConcini from Arizona, who is chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee at this point, and he claims he saw what he had to see, who's public, enough is enough. So we have the sentencing we have today, but let's talk a little bit of a, a little understanding of where Jonathan was coming from. <coughs> if you go back to the first Gulf War, 90, 91, remember? Scuds coming from Iraq, that the Israelis didn't respond to at the request of the United States. Just want to put that in. Okay. Well, if you remember, if you were there, or you paid attention, the morning up before the Scud attacks, so when it started, the Haggai, the volunteer police, the volunteer force, handed out five million gas masks. Remember? And if they didn't have a gas mask, they told you, quote unquote, seal a room. Put plastic and tape, seal a room. That if God forbid those scuds would have gas, we'd be prepared. A very simple question for you. Where did Israel get five million gas masks one morning? Walmart isn't there. <laughs> right? Why would they have five billion gas masks? Why would they know what to do? The answer is Jonathan Pollard gave them information on the potential gas capability coming out of Iraq. Now, don't laugh, but Israel needed gas masks. What country makes the best gas masks or the best gas? They went to Germany and said, we need to buy gas masks. Germany wouldn't sell it to them. They went to England and England wouldn't sell it to them. So like good Israelis, they took the best gas masks, they took them apart, and they made their own. But in Israel, Jonathan was known as the ghost of the sealed rooms because it was his information that facilitated that God forbid, had, that, had those gods had gas, we would have been prepared. So in a certain sense, Jonathan was responsible for the saving of potentially tens of thousands of lives. That's what he gave up his freedom for. Because he cared. And I want you to know, he still cares. It's amazing. In prison for 25 years, and you can ha I have a conversation with him, he has depth and he has breadth. If he'd be sitting here now, you wouldn't leave till next Shabbos. He'd sit here, spellbound. Because of what he has to say and what he has to do. That's Jonathan Pollard. Again, he committed a crime. We accept that. Do you want to rationalize why he did it? That's God willing, he'll get out and we'll sit and discuss the reasons he did what he did. The reasons could we have done what he did if we had that information. Jonathan was not in the service. He was not involved in Israel when the, the Israelis bombed the, um, whatever is this reactor? Osirak. Osirak. But the consequence of that was the Defense Department was mad at Israel for destroying the reactor that, thank God, everybody laughed at the facts, realized it was the best thing that could have happened. Right? And they stopped giving information that by, by treaty they were responsible to give to Israel. By the way, if there would have been gas in those scuds, you want to guess where the gas would have originated from? No, Boca Raton, Florida. Boca Raton, Florida. You've heard of Bechtel, George Weinberger, George Schultz. You remember the, the names? Well, they had an interest in the Bechtel Chemical Corporation that makes, that made or made insecticide, pesticide. For some reason, they got special waivers for that company to open up an insecticide plant in Iraq. I have not been in Iraq in a long time. I don't think I've ever been in Iraq. But the bottom line is, I'm not sure what they need insecticide for. The answer is, if you need to take, what is insecticide and pesticide? 
it's certain chemicals that will kill the insects. If you increase the chemical allotment to go from insecticide to pesticide to human sign, it's just a question of percentages. Had our troops in the Gulf War been affected by gas, it would have originated in Boca Raton, Florida. Now, Jonathan didn't know that. All this came out afterwards when certain things happened. Jonathan was at the wrong place at the right at the wrong time because if you remember, who built up Saddam Hussein? We did. Not me, I mean uh, the Americans. Right? And he got caught in all that. And that was the information he had. Committal a crime. Let's see if you remember some people. Jonathan's crime was one count. Yeah, but one count of giving information to a friend, to an ally country. Not an enemy country, an ally country. It's a difference, number one. Number two, he was given the paragraph that says without intent to harm the United States. That's the crime he was indicted for. Today, if he did that crime, maybe you get six months, right? In this government, maybe you get nothing. But the bottom line is, two, four, six years, maybe. Let me leave you a list of names you may know. These are people who spied for American allies. If I have to read you the list of spies who were, who were sentenced to life, guess how many there are spying for an ally? Just one. Just Jonathan Pollard. Michael Schwartz. Spied for Saudi Arabia, his punishment, he was discharged from the army. You go, China, Great Britain, El Salvador. Number one, you gotta figure out how much they were, how, what their punishment was. But then you can't stop there. You gotta figure out what they actually served. You know, eight years, served five months. 41 months, 15, I mean, you can go on. But let me read you some other numbers. <coughs> Let me work backwards. How about, how many people can you imagine got life spying for the enemy? A couple more. No, the walkers are out. You know the walkers? They're, they walked, they're finished. They were gone. Some earlier, some later, some of these names that you've got, I don't know, Harold Nicholson, David Boone, some of the names some of us may remember. Michael Walker? He got 25 years, walked after 15. Okay, trying to think. Richard Miller, some of the names you may know. But let me give you a couple names that may ring a bell. Gentlemen, Aldridge Ames, Robert Hansen, these guys were spying for the Soviet Union. They got life. But let me give you a little bit of extra background. All right, let me repeat one of these names. A gentleman named Aldridge Ames, spying for the Russians. Guess who was Jonathan's boss? Aldridge Ames. Guess who wrote the, the information packet on what Pollard did? Aldridge Ames. So when all of a sudden, when you put down he did A, B, C, and D, fine. But a year or two or three later, I don't remember when they finally caught Aldridge Ames and they discovered he was the real spy. If you're a member of the Rabbi's Talmud class, you'd say, wait a minute. If Aldridge Ames did all this, then we have to go back a little bit and analyze what he passed on to Pollard. No one did that. <coughs> That's not what happened. Aldridge Ames is a prison for life. And Paul is in prison for life. Something is wrong here. Right? If I told you how many people have tried to get access to that secret document on the American side, courtesy of the work of, of um, what did I say, Anthony Weiner, congressman from Brooklyn. Last time we went to trial, a couple years back, he, he produced that 40 to 50 times that Weinberger memo was accessed by the government. 
And Jonathan Pollard's top secret cleared attorneys can't get <coughs> near it. Senator Dennis DeConcini at his time, chairman of the, he couldn't get near it. He had no need to. Anthony Weiner claims he saw the document. I can't tell you that he did. And he claims, I can't tell you what's in it, it's top secret, but all I can tell you is it has nothing to keep Pollard in jail. I once asked, or somebody was with me, and he asked Jonathan, I think the chief rabbi, Rabbi Metzger, Yonah Metzger, chief rabbi of Israel. I took him down to see Jonathan, and he asked Jonathan, Jonathan, is there anything missing? Any piece of the story we don't know about? And he said, Rabbi, do you think I'd have my f attorneys fighting to get that document if that document would keep me in prison? I saw the document 25 years ago. I saw it very quickly. I'm telling you there's nothing in it to keep me in prison. Would I fight for it if it was? Lately, as you, if you've been reading, Jim Woolsey came out again. You got sent congressmen, a lot of activity. In Israel, there's a lot of activity. Unfortunately, the two people at the ends of the spectrum, President Obama over here and Prime Minister Netanyahu over here, we don't know what they're thinking. But let me tell you a little more about this man who sacrificed, I don't know whether he realized or he thought he'd get life. He believed in what he was doing. He grew up in a very Zionistic family. He had been to Israel. He wasn't religious, but he had a Yiddish heart and a Yiddish neshama. And when all this came down, he felt he had no choice. He says he made a mistake. He should, like I said, his father told him you should have quit the service. And then when you quit, you're outside, your restrictions are less. But he says, when you're under a gun and you're under pressure and you have to make a decision, we don't think straight. So again, he says he committed a crime. There should have been another way to do things. But at the end of the day, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 15, 20, enough. We're not asking, and Jonathan, by the way, is not asking for a par not asking for pardon. Pardon, by definition, means you wipe the slate clean. He says, I committed a crime. I want clemency for time served. Kick me out, says, get me out of prison. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope you never have to go to prison or visit anybody in prison, but prison isn't a good place to be, okay? Not in a federal prison, not in a prison that is 150% occupied, not in a prison where the chief medical director was given two options because he, he, was, he killed somebody in his medical profession. He had whatever, he was given the choice. 10 years serving in prison as the medical director of the prison. You can imagine the kind of medical director they've got. If you're a good doctor, you don't end up serving these kind of guys. I'm not gonna tell you what goes on. It's not a safe place. When I walk in, obviously I'm in the external, I'm in the visiting room, it's clean, it's beautiful, it's quiet, it's nice. I'm not back in the rooms, in the camp, whatever the case may be. Um, people don't know it, but you can imagine the gang warfare and the gangs and Jonathan is respected in the prison because he did something that took guts to do and they respect that. And <coughs> Excuse me. At the same time, he minds his own business. Doesn't get involved, he tries to stay away. You know what? The prison isn't a good place. But let me give you a couple of stories to testify on the depth and the breadth of this individual. I was at Raleigh Durham two weeks ago. I mentioned earlier I took Rabbi Shlomo Avinir, the Shiva of, of uh, Ateret Kohanim, down to see Jonathan. I could tell the pain Jonathan was in. I could tell. He had kidney stones. It took us weeks to get any service. It's, it's, it's a holy mess. But at one point, Jonathan commented on some of the medication he was taking, and the person with me, another person, was a heavy-duty medic. He knew his stuff. He commented, you must feel the pain and the nausea, but he made a comment which I 
affected me, and I tell it over. He said to the, the medic, the person who was a medic, you know, an EMT, an Hatzol in New York, commented, you know, you have to drink a lot. You want to pass the kidney stones, the medication, without blinking an eyelash, blinking an eye. Jonathan reacted, yes, that's one of the silver linings in this illness. And we looked at him like, what are you talking about? He says, we said, what? He says, because I have to drink a lot, it gives me a chance to make more brachas every day. Rabbi, I can't say on me that I think that way. Right? Without blinking an eyelash, reacting as a natural, gives me a chance to say brachas. I tell over another story where my kids who were younger a couple of years back and they wanted something. I told over the father, I tell it over. I once got a call from Jonathan, going back 15 years. <coughs> when he called me, we raised money to put in his canteen so he has money for kosher products, for canteen, for stamps, for telephones, whatever he needs. He calls me up one day and says, Pesach, I just want to say thank you. I said, okay, you're welcome. What will I do? He says, the canteen money, I splurged this morning. You know, I'm thinking, how do you splurge in prison? He says, the prison got in, the um, canteen, got in small containers of pineapple juice. Pesach, I love pineapple juice. I haven't had pineapple juice in 10 years. I splurged and I had a can of pineapple juice. I'm calling to say thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, right, the sense of appreciation, the sense of what's lacking, the menschlichkeit that he's able to call out and say, that's lessons I've learned. Right? I used to be able to say that half of my garage had Jonathan Pollard's books. It got to the point that my wife said, there's no garage left, and we were able to find somebody with a warehouse. Jonathan spends all his time reading, a lot of time reading. He's an expert on alternative energy, right? Jewish history, Zionism, and I'm missing something, military history, I'm missing something. I can't pronounce the names on the book, the title page, and he who knows the footnotes. It's very bright. Let me tell you another story, and I'm open for questions because I'm just trying to give you a piece of everything here. I can go through his legal briefs, all right, and you go to court and you sit there and you can't believe you're in the United States of America of what the questions and challenges are being made. All right, you're in the prison system, you can't figure it out. Unfortunately, you go to Israel and you can't figure out why the Israeli government has, made this, has not made this a priority. Unfortunately, they haven't. Jonathan Pollard had to sue his wife and he sued in Supreme Court in Israel to make him an Israeli citizen, because they denied it. The prisoners of Zion from the Soviet, former Soviet Union voted and put a petition in that Jonathan Pollard should be classified as a prisoner of Zion. You think it's simple, right? It's in the Supreme Court because the Israeli government refuses to accept it. I can't answer you why. I can tell you the facts. Jonathan Pollard in the United States justice system is considered a rogue agent, which means nobody's taking responsibility for him because the Israeli government refuses, and I don't know why, to tell the United States government he's one of ours. Because if he'd be listed as an Israeli agent, he'd have a lot more benefits, health-wise and, and telephone-wise and everything else. And they don't. I can't tell you. We fought. Things are happening now in Israel. People are waking up. Halavai that it continues. Let me tell you some other stuff about Jonathan Pollard. I took a rabbi down probably four or five years ago. And in the course of the conversation, Jonathan told us that he used to have, for the phone calls, one of the people he used to call was Rabbi Moshe Sher of the Agudath Israel of America organization. Rabbi Sher Zetzel. And he shared over the following conversation. 
Rabbi Sher asked him, Jonathan, do me three favors. Try to keep kosher the best you can, try to keep Shabbos the best you can, and don't be mad at God. The rabbi that was with me was fast on his feet. And he said, Jonathan, if Rabbi Sher would walk in the door now, what would you tell him? And he thought a second. And he said, Rabbi Sher, and I'll come back and give you all the explanations in a second. Kashris, I did the best that I could. Shabbos, I did the best that I could. Talking to God, I'm not angry. One day I'll understand. I have some very difficult, serious and difficult conversations with him, but I'm not upset. I mean, this is the man he is. Now let's go back a second. Jonathan Pollard used to work. In prison you have to work. I mean, you only make 36 cents an hour, but you have to work. <coughs> he was in an eyeglass factory. They were make, cutting out lenses. And he stopped. He requested the transfer from there because that means on Shabbos he has to be Machal Shabbos. He has to profane the Shabbos. So what did he do? He offered to be an orderly. It's a nice word. An orderly means you clean toilets and windows and showers. I apologize for saying it, but you can't, maybe, we, we shouldn't be able to imagine what goes on in a prison, in the showers and in the bathrooms. And that was his job to clean it up. Okay, and, and he knew what he was getting into. But that means on Shabbos he has a little more control of what he does and does not do. When it comes to kosher, there are times that Jonathan doesn't get kosher food. You can tell me it's a prison, it's federal law, you can give me all the excuses. But every time he makes a tumult, it comes back to haunt him. Right? So he doesn't make a tumult. And if you know, he gets the, he'll get some meat. Sometimes, by the time it gets to him, right, it's called in halacha basa shenis ale min ha'ayin. If you have meat that's kosher in a non-kosher environment, and you don't, and it lose, you, the Jew loses sight of it, you're not allowed to eat it because you don't know if it's the same meat. Well, Jonathan has a bigger problem. In the, in my field, I call basa shenis ale min ha'ayin min ha'ayin min ha'ayin. By the time it gets to him, it's four or five times he doesn't know who, who went it. So there are times he doesn't get, times he does get. But there was a period of time that he never got kosher food. So Jonathan takes what they call common fear. He goes the regular line, takes the vegetarian. Bread, potatoes, things that he holds and feels are less than... Um, and he used to take the money that people contributed and buy tuna fish, sardines, until the doctor told him you're eating more fish in a day than I eat in a month. His mercury level is high. That's kosher. Came Pesach time, Jonathan Pollard had one box of Manischewitz matzah for eight days. That's all he had. He had some other odds and ends, but it got messed up. You know, every Pesach, I know, I'm doing this for years already. I spring into action. I'm ready to go. Because let me tell you what happens in prison. Pesach, you got good food. They're bringing in canned goods and frozen, right? So guess what? Six, week, eight weeks before Pesach, they ask anybody who's interested in kosher food who's a Jew. They don't ask you for your ID card. So all of a sudden, everybody's Jewish. So six, eight weeks before Pesach, 40 people claim they're Jewish and they sign up to get kosher food for Passover. That's wonderful. But as these 40 start talking about it, and maybe three or four really deserve it, all of a sudden, another 40 wake up and say, wait a minute, I'm Jewish too! Because they also want the special food. So the prison ordered enough food for 40 people. Now they have to take that food for 40 people and serve it to 80 people which in basic math means everyone got less than before. Last Pesach, I'm on the phone with two congressmen, three congressmen, right, who we had called the day before when Jonathan told us, tells his wife, and she tells me, we have problems with food. We only have enough for half. 
So Congressman Anthony Weiner, Jerry Nadler, I think it was Jerry Nadler at the time. I'm sitting there burning my hummus and he's calling me. He says, Rabbi, I'll tell you the story. I don't believe a word of it, but I'll tell you the story. I called the warden yesterday. Congressman, get back to me. I called the warden again and I want to know why Pollard doesn't have enough kosher food. Where is it? It was ordered for him. So I want you to know, in the course of an hour, we had four different answers. One answer was, as enough, it's in the warehouse. Why did the warden didn't know that yesterday? The other answer is, we had more people, we've ordered more. The third answer was, is it's sitting here anyway, I don't know who told you. Right? Only because we had three congressmen on the backs of the warden, was Jonathan able to get his food. That's food, that's Shabbos, that's davening. With your permission, let me tell you, and I add another one. Jonathan Pollard's respect, it's not going to have the right word, and keeping what we, you and I would call Taras Hamishbacha, family purity, basic morals, his ability to be sane and moral in the environment he's in, I think surpasses everything, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. He's living in an environment when you walk in, I only know what I see, I'm in a visiting room. People are there, there are two types of people in that, besides some exceptions. In that prison, you're either a murderer, right, or you're a child molester in some form or fashion. Jonathan used to have a roommate who was a child molester, he couldn't handle that. Today his roommate murdered his wife, that he can handle that better. He says, at least I know who you are. Okay, that's the level he's living. What can we do? I don't know, Rabbi, I don't know, give me the time, I can keep going. Okay, I don't know if I'm boring anybody or... What can we do? We can always dive in. <laughs> Number one, that's important. Number two, I left on the table a tefillah that was put out by the chief rabbi of Israel. Number two, go visit your congressman and senator and ask them to please explain to you why Pollard is still in jail. There's a letter recently signed by 39 Democratic congressmen to the president, enough is enough. It asked me whether Republicans were, it's a, it's a political issue. They didn't want to give them the cover, etc. Okay, we have to make it an issue. We have to talk about it. We have to get our kids to talk about it. If Jonathan, I hate to say this, if Jonathan would have been anything but a Jew spying for Israel, he wouldn't be there anymore. And we have to not let it go. And we can't forget. If you want to write a letter, on the website is an address. But the bottom line is that he's there, crime, we passed that, I put it on the record, but I don't know that if I'd be able to do what he did if the situation arose. People out there that think he should stay in prison, Jews. There's still Jewish organizations, I mean, we're still fighting. If you knew what I knew, what he knew, what she knew, you wouldn't say it. And I tell people, after 25 years, what did he know? George Schultz, former Secretary of Defense. Of State, thank you. Right, when it came to the Refuseniks and the Russians, they, the Russians said, we can't let him go. He used to work in top secret places. He was a physicist, he was there. So Schultz said, if he's been out of the system for five years, there's nothing he knows that is relevant anymore. Jonathan's been out of the system for 25 years. There's nothing relevant that Jonathan doesn't know anymore. Jonathan Pollard is a man that cared. He made a decision. He suffered for that decision. He's still suffering for that decision. And that's 20 some years, too much, too long. And we do whatever we can on the rabbinic world, on the communal world, on the political world, keeping him, giving him what we can to help him until he gets out. And I gotta tell you, he believes with every bone in his body 
that God got him in, and God will get him out. He came, when Jonathan was camping, he was not a religious man. He grew up and he went to shul on, uh, in, in, in South Bend, Indiana, with his parents. He went to Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Pesach, he had a Seder, but he wasn't a religious man. He got into prison and he started analyzing. And he said, it doesn't make any sense. If you put this into a computer, it won't compute. There's something bigger here than me. And from the depths of where he was, he started to become religious. You may know the name Pastor John Hagee. Pastor John Hagee is the evangelical pastor from San Antonio, Texas. Right. He started an organization called Kufi Christians United for Israel. Four years ago, three years ago, I took Pastor John Hagee down to see Jonathan Pollard. So number one, to his credit, he went. Long story, I went to visit him at the conference. Some people were here, I think some of them were at the conference. I went to visit him at the conference. His rabbi, right, the pastor has a rabbi. Okay, Rabbi Aya Scheinberg, who's been in San Antonio for many, many years, Hamish a guy, he introduced me, we met. Pastor Hagee took us up to his private suite in the hotel, he offered us to drink, and before we even had a second, don't worry, it's all kosher. <laughs> he went with me three, four, I'm trying to think, three years ago, four years ago, Rabbi Scheinberg, Pastor Hagee, one or two others, some people from Young Israel, we had seven or eight or nine people in the visiting room. And we sat there for two hours where Jonathan Pollard kept Pastor Hagee spellbound with his story and with his an, 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 an analysis of what's going on. And I walked out and Pastor Hagee looked at me, Rabbi, I'm a man of faith. That's what I do for a living. I preach faith. I have never seen a man of faith like that before in my life. This is Pastor John Hagee. I turned to Rabbi Aya Scheinberg and I said, well, I think, I guess you have enough material for your joshas for Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. <laughs> and he looks at me, material, I have to do tshuva. <laughs> right? This is the man. Right? This is the man, we'll get off on some tangents. When a discussion came on in Israel, that we should, that the Israeli government, there were discussions we should switch Pollard over here and Bargudi, if you know the name Bargudi? Bargudi is a man who has a 180 year sentence in Israeli jails because he killed numerous Israelis, children, babies, etc. <coughs> when the discussion was we should switch Bargudi for Jonathan Pollard, Jonathan Pollard came out with a statement. He says, I was a soldier once. I'll be a soldier again. If Bargudi is free, statistically it'll be, he'll kill hundreds of Jews again. And I cannot have my freedom tied to that. Right? We talked about freeing a thousand prisoners, different conversation for Gilad Shalit, and throw in Pollard. Pollard said again, I can't speak for Shalit. But for me, don't release a thousand prisoners for Jonathan Pollard, because if you do, those thousand Arabs will murder another thousand Jews, and I can't be responsible for that. That's the Jonathan Pollard who wants to come home, who wants to go home, who wants to get out. But, he's, and he, but uh, he, when he says it, it's not a political ploy. I need to tell you, he means it with every depth of his body. He has, I'm getting off on tangents, I've taken political leadership, Israeli political leadership down there, and he's able to tell them in very clear terms what they should and should not be doing. I don't know how he has all that information, but he knows. And by the way, Jonathan is a very special prisoner. He can't touch the TV button. He can't touch a slide rule, a computer, a, a, a ruler, a calculator. Don't, you're looking at me like, I can't answer the question. Right? What's he going to do with a calculator? All the other prisoners can touch a calculator. 
a ruler, they can change the station on the TV, he's not allowed to touch the station. He's special. You figure it out. I can't. Okay? And we can go on. All right, we can go on on what he did, the information he gave and didn't give. Jonathan claims, and again, I can only tell you what he says, that he gave very specific information, anything that came out of the Middle Eastern seaboard area of items that would harm the Israelis. He says the Israelis asked him for other stuff, and he said no. The only things I was willing to give was things that by treaty the Americans should have given and could have had a, a, a defensive or a effect on the Israelis. He claims he was very specific in what he gave. Please. I, the, the, apparently the one with, under discussion was legal. So therefore, the crime that America committed in not giving the information that threatened all of Israel's lives is worse than the crime that the did. Okay. So why doesn't any of them go to jail? That's a better question the I haven't... The Israeli government is a bunch of ingrates. But what he did for them, to let them sit there all these I years. can't argue with you. I can't argue with you. Okay, let's go. Question, please. How do we effectively communicate in two places? One, in the U.S. Congress, are there lists of congressmen and senators, those who are in or who will be coming in, who are already known to be uh, accessible, who are quote, on our side, you, you, the, on our side? Are there those who are known that need extra work to communicate, to get their attention? And then the other question is, what can we as American citizens do to communicate to the Israeli government, the Knesset? Who do we approach? Not, not just the general blanket I, okay, my suggestion would be stay that's within your power. For you to go to a congressman in Pennsylvania, he doesn't have to answer the phone. Who are your congressmen? Stay right here. Go after your congressman here. Go. I'm with you, but I'm talking about networking with our friends in Pennsylvania. To so the answer is every. Let me let me answer your question in a broader question. Give me a time frame, Rabbi. Okay, let me, give you, let me answer your question in a broader time frame. I believe and I preach that every shul needs to have an Israel Action Committee. Okay, let me say this. I know I'm on tape, so I'll have to clean up my words. Do you know what it would take to, to properly and legally influence your congressman? Invite him to the shul twice a year to speak. Before the speech, have him at somebody's house for an official, legal, above-board parlor meeting for the congressman. If you do that twice a year and you invite him, trust me, when the rabbi calls, all right, he'll answer the phone. Because you've done more than most people will do. You've invited him and you've supported him or her. Malcolm Holine, you know the name, Malcolm Holine, Executive Vice Chairman of the Conference of Presidents of American Jewish Organization, right? He tells over a story. He tells over a story that many years ago, he, there was an issue going on in Israel, and he and one or two of the key conference volunteers went down to Washington to start talking to congressmen. And they had an appointment with a black congressman from the Midwest, excuse me, from the South, the Deep South, right? And they walked in, and they started having a conversation with the congressman. He stopped them. He said, you don't waste your time, I'm on your side. And the congressman started filling in the facts. And he knew, they asked him, congressman, how do you know so much? How many Jews are in your district? And he goes, two. And they never let me forget it. <laughs> they support me. They call me. They call me before a vote what I should vote. They call me after the vote if they didn't like what I did. They come down to my office. They send me Hanukkah presents. He said, I have two, and they're active. If we would have an Israel Action Alliance in the shul, and we'd go after our local congressmen, 
and let them know we're going to watch what you do, we're going to be there to support you, we'll support you financially, but we expect to be, res we, we expect to be respected and we expect you to come down and when there's a vote and you, you hold them to the fire. You know what? That's what we can do for Pollard and for Israel. And the same thing with the Senate. Senator, Senator, you have to invite three times to the parliament meeting, right? There's a little more, it's a six year, not a two year. And by the way, you guys have an Israeli constant in LA, don't you? Yes. Okay, go visit them and tell them. This is what, this is what our concerns are, right? Pollard, a united Jerusalem. Gush Katif, Yehuda Shamron. You get me started, I'll be here more than 20 minutes. Okay? Because you know what? The other side tells them what they want. Right? Peace Now, and the New Israel Fund, and J Street. Somehow they're there. Yes, with all the, the accolades I could give them. <laughs> we have to be there too. And by the way, that means this shul, and the shul down the block, that's where we make a difference. Because if the, we nudge the congressmen, they listen. Because they're afraid of the vote, they're afraid to understand something. If 50 people walk in, they assume that 50 people represent a lot more. If 27 people write a letter against, they assume that one person represents 10,000 who didn't write. I don't know what papers are local, the LA Times and others. There should be somebody looking at the paper, and every time there's a negative article, right, you've got Stand With Us uh, coming out of LA, you've got camera, you have good organizations. I say that everybody in this room should spend 20 minutes a day for Klal Yisrael. Write a letter, make a phone call, say a tefillah. If we do that, and it catches, and it's not only Pollard, right? And we have to be creative, and we have to have some guts, and we have to show up where no one else is going to show up. There's an interesting medrash, and a medrash, a pasuk. Go back two or three parshas, with the rabbi's permission, I'll darshan a little bit. Right? Yosef comes to see his brothers. His, bro his brothers over there say, Bala Chalomos, the dreamer's coming. Guess what? Vayomer Eliam Ruvain Ruvain tells them, you with me, Atish Bechudam. Don't spill blood. Hashlich Rosal Alabo Azeh Shebem Midbo. Throw him into the pit. The Yod Atish Lechubo. And don't put a finger on him. Let me read you the rest of the Pasuk. And somebody tell me who the Torah is quoting. Right? Laman Hatzil Osomi Yodam. His intention was to save. Yosef from the brothers, La Shiva Elaviv, to bring him back to his father. This wasn't Ruvain's conversation. This was not Ruvain giving to secret to his brothers. He told his brothers, What are you wasting? Put him in the boar. What was he thinking, Ruvain? Ruvain was thinking, he wasn't verbalizing it. What's Ruvain's intentions? I'll come back later when you're not looking. I'll take him out and I'll take him home. The Torah says it. The Medrash says, can you imagine if Ruvain would have realized what the Torah is writing about him? He would have put Yosef on his shoulders and would have banned taking him home. Somebody showed me a greeting card recently. I hold it's a beautiful thought. If something is worth doing, it's worth overdoing. Cute? Right? Can you imagine if Ruvain would have understood what was going on? We don't know what our actions are. We don't, Ruvain had no idea that his actions, he saved Yosef, he affected Jewish history. We don't know what action we take or we don't take, how big it's going to be. Ruvain thought he's doing a brotherly favor. You know the story of Aaron and Moshe? Aaron was the leader of the Jewish people. Moshe was in Midian. Moshe's coming back down. Moshe says, what do you want from me? I'm going to insult Aaron. So it says in the talk, right? It says that when Moshe came in, Aaron went to greet him. 
The Somach Belibo, in his heart, Aaron was happy to see his brother. The Medrash says, who wrote that? Aaron didn't write it. The Torah wrote on Aharon HaKohen that he was happy to see his brother. Says the Medrash, if Aaron would have known the result of his actions, he would have come out to meet Moshe Rabbeinu with a 50-piece band. So the tells the Rosh Hashiva of Bloch, so it's very simple. We don't know which actions we take are going to be historical in perspective. So if we do it, do everything we do as if it is, because we don't know which ones are or are not. Every action we take in our political activity, I don't hold this as political activity, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not into politics. I don't hold Gush Katif as political activity. I don't hold that the United Yerushalayim is political activity. I don't hold that the fact that Kever Rachel is not a mosque, never was a mosque, is political activity. I don't hold that the Tomb of the Patriarchs belongs to us as political activity. I don't hold that the Kult of HaMaravi, the Western Wall, the Temple Mount exists as political activity. It's religious. Alright, I'll go one step farther. I don't believe that Zionism is political activity either. Count how many times in davening you mentioned Yerushalayim, you mentioned Sion. If you take those words out of the davening, you've got half of davening. All right. Kodesh Baruch Hu gave us the land. All right. That's where we're supposed to be. God willing, we'll all be there soon. In one fight. But that's what he gave us. Half the mitzvahs are not to be done in New York or in California. They were in Israel. He gave it to us. We don't have to be defensive. We have a right to be proud. And we have to act on that pride. So it means Pollard. It means Gilad Shalit, whatever we can do. It means the Israeli soldiers missing in action. It means Yerushalayim, and I can go on. But we have to act upon it as if we care. And if enough people, I repeat, if you go to your congressman and you force their hand on a monthly basis and you pick up the phone and you make an appointment, he is going, he or she is going to know what's important to you. And that translates to them into votes. And if you give them a couple dollars, legal all the way in your right, they're going to respect you and appreciate you even more. That's what we can do. A couple questions over here. I don't want to... I just want the other hand. The other. Where people need help getting to their congressman or senator. I, mean, we can work with, I'm I, I, I apologize for responding. If you handle your neighborhood, you'll accomplish a lot. But if we've already got our neighborhood. I don't know if you got, then move out. I don't know who your congressmen are, Congress people are. Pardon? It's going to be pressure on Israel from us. You know what? So then go to the, then so you guys should visit twice a year the the council here and let them know what you feel. Please, uh, uh, wait a second. I apologize. APAC is not where we're supposed to be. Right. APAC is important. <laughs> APAC is important. But APAC is pushing for a two-state solution before BB was. Right? Unfortunately, I think we have to be a little different than APAC. APAC is good. They do a lot of good work. Don't get me wrong. But that's not the end of the discussion. Right? And we need more, maybe we need more yarmulkes going to APEC to push APEC farther. Right? But you can't leave it the way it is. It's, it's an action item. We're not there yet. I'm sorry, the gentleman behind you. One second. He's been in office you know, well over 20 years. Um, do you know if he's been I think he signed the last letter. Okay. And he's basically okay on Israel. I mean, he's got a two-state solution theory, and he still thinks it can work, and he still thinks that he needs some pushing. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, he signed the Pollard letter recently. Okay, but he needs pushing. He still, he still believes, he still believes there can be peace, and he still believes the Palestinians are good people, and he still believes a lot of things. And he has to be, I've been through his office, I have a lot of friends who know him, he still needs a little bit of an education. So I think people have to sit down with him and push. 
and, and do your homework. Before you go, you'll do your homework. So you know what to talk to him. He's bright, he's not, right? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, all three, our congressmen here, Congressman Berman, plus both of California's senators, Senator Boxer and Senator Feinstein, are all Jewish. Uh, it's maybe, uh, tell me what you think. Uh, would it be a good idea for all the shuls in this area, Shari Tzedek, Young Israel Valley Village, Shari Yerushalayim, yeah, go ahead. all these shuls, to come together as a community, invite these people over for Shabbos, and well, not Shabbos, but yes, it would be a great idea to invite your senators, who are, your two senators have a long way to go in these issues. Well, and show them that we are united. Yes, yes, yes. You bring them down, you put a 500 people, whatever the number is, in a room, and you introduce them, and you let them know what you think. And you follow up with letters and phone calls, the two senators here. Howard Berman is a lot, lot much better. The senators have a long way to go, as far as I know. Two questions. The, the onus, as Moshe here was saying, is on Israel. Why didn't Israel accept him into the embassy in the first place? And two, it seems that there may be vested interests in Israel who don't want him to be well, free. First of all, I you don't know the answer to that. Uh, if I know the answer, I tell you. I know the threw him out. Rubenstein claims he didn't know, he wasn't paying attention, he wasn't there. No arguments. The point's the following. He's sitting in an American prison. It's the American justice system, right? It's in the power of President Obama in 30 seconds to let him go. So we have to, count on the humanitarian issue, 25 years, enough is enough, we have to pressure Congress, that's where we have to go. You said yourself, Israelis, if he was an Israeli citizen. Well, I can only tell you that it was Shimon Peres who handed back, they, the Israelis, who was it? Schultz, I'm trying to think, who was, they called up and Israel said, okay, where's the stuff? Sharon Paris, who was at the time rotating prime minister, decided to hand back all the stuff that Jonathan gave. It's bad enough you spy, you don't give back all the information. One second. There's another deal. There's an Abba Ibn report that Abba Ibn did. He was asked a member of Knesset, he had a commission. They had a commission on Pollard. And they discovered Abba Ibn in his report claims that Israel made a deal with the Americans. We'll give you back the paperwork on one condition. You use it for damage control, but you don't use it against Pollard. They walked the next day into Pollard, and they said, Jonathan, this is what you took. In fact, your fingerprints are still on it. And they used that against Jonathan. Jonathan didn't know until 10 years later when we got the hold of the Eben report, which was top secret, right, that there was a deal. How did we get the Eben report? Not me. The team? We knew it, ex again, we is not me. I was part of the team. We knew it existed, but it was in top secret department in, 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 in Knesset. Does it stand to reason that there is really well, let's backtrack. Let's backtrack. Ayud Barak, Ayud Barak, Shimon Peres, um, Ariel Shara, Arik Sharon, these people were in office when Jonathan... So, you tell me uh, there's a vested interest. The only one who wasn't is Bibi. Bibi went to the mat at Y. He didn't go far enough. And I can't tell you why today Bibi's fighting it. I don't know. I, I have no idea. But you ca we can't mess up the fact that you, it's, he's in American jail. It's an American responsibility. Dr. Lawrence Korb is in Israel today. There's a meeting in Knesset tomorrow where he's calling upon, well, see if he does it, Prime Minister to publicly call upon for Jonathan's release. He's never done that. No? Uh, what, uh, what message does uh, Pollard's incarceration hold on behalf of the, uh, the U.S. government, CIA, uh, Secret Service, and the, the, the halls of power, what message does, this, does that have about its contempt for American Jewry? In your Are you asking or telling? I'm asking you. You're asking me or telling? I'm asking you. Do, do you feel that there's a, there's a, a message? They say, Shailas Chacham is Chatzit Tshuva. The question of a wise man is half the answer. Obviously, if you go today into the CIA 
and you take a tour of the CIA facilities, they give you the top 10 spies. And guess who's one of the top 10? Pollard, today. We've had a lot of people since. Okay? Dennis Ross, who at the time was the advisor to President Clinton, at Y, when supposedly BB had a deal with Clinton to let him go, and then George Tenet apparently, supposedly, because everyone denies everything, supposedly said, if you let Pollard go, I quit. And Dennis Ross told the president, which Dennis Ross wrote in his autobiography, and he has said this publicly, I told the president, Pollard should go free already. But he's too valuable a trading card to give him away now. Hold on to him, you're going to need him later. You know how many times Jonathan was traded and switched for this and for that? Numerous times already. It's enough. It's a time that the Americans fulfill the part of the bargain. So the bottom line is, who knows? We don't know. All I can tell you is I took Natan Sharansky and Avital Sharansky, maybe 10 years ago already, down to see Jonathan. And afterwards, Natan Sharansky, because he's Natan Sharansky, went to Washington and met with the CIA people and the FBI people. Okay? And I don't remember which one told them which, but he told me the following. One told him, CIA, I've, that's what I was, we never look back. That's history. We never look back, we never change, we never adapt, that's not what we do. We'll spend the time and effort to fight that we don't change what we did, it's history. And the other one told him, it's not Pollard. Pollard should be free. He's in there to warn you Jews, don't ever do it again. Okay? What major, uh, what major uh, Jewish organization? Because there's three or four that are against it. Why are they against it? Because we're Jewish and we're liberal. Okay? And why is peace now against everything that's right? Because that's peace now. Okay, we have exhausted, we, I'm not, I'm not a legal person. His lawyers are two Shomer Shabbat Jews who have done tremendous work, pro bono. Okay, they've exhausted every legal option. So nothing is going There's nothing, no, no, all, you said legal. There's no appeals going on, there's nothing left legal. So, so the, only the only thing is political. The only option is, the only option is political. Pardon or? Not a pardon, a clemency. He, what? He could be pardoned. He doesn't want. He has to be let out to be pardoned. The commutation. Okay, commutation. Bottom line is, it's now, put it this way. Two years ago, when George Bush, right, was president or leaving, long story, but is, but we hired, I don't know if you know the, if you know the name, Harriet Myers. Harriet Myers was the president's legal counsel in Texas. She went with him to Washington. She was her senior legal counsel. Okay, the president nominated her for Supreme Court Justice, and the Democrats went, what? I, I gotta watch this, you gotta watch my flow over here, it's ironic. And the Democrats went after her because she had no bench experience. Does that sound familiar? Someone who had no bench experience is now a Supreme Court judge? I just wanna be sure we got the right, you know. Chuck Schumer, my senator, who well, I didn't vote for, my, don't, I didn't say that, my senator, <laughs> my senator, right, went wild when they, because he's on the Judicial Committee, when they had suggested Harriet Myers. But he was the first one defending, right, right. what best experience did she have? Thank you. Okay, long story, Rabbi knew, Jeff, Adel, um, no, Eula. Adlerstein. Jeff Adlerstein. Rabbi Adlerstein, you know Rabbi Adlerstein? He has a son working in a law firm in Houston, Texas, in Dallas, Texas. And we, through connections, happens to be that Harriet Myers is in, his, in the firm. And long story short, with his help, you know, we ended up hiring Harriet Myers. You have to be 180 days outside the White House before you can go lobby anything else. We hired her to help us take the case. 
And when she started the case, this is nothing secret, she said, Rabbi, you don't even have, I don't give you a 5% chance. And I said, Ms. Myers, I'll pay for a 5% chance. Okay, we raised the money. Okay, not important. She was wonderful. Two weeks, a week before the end of the presidency, she called me up and she says, remember I told you 5%? Today I'll give you 50%. She said she'd never talked to the president because that was her relationship. We think she did. She got our attorneys into the pardon lawyers that she had hired. We had, thought we had a case. Natan, at one of the parties that President Bush had, you know, for all his friends and cronies, the president told Mrs. somebody from Vegas, right, Adelson, Mrs. Adelson, she asked the president about Polly, said, I'm thinking about it. First time we ever heard anything. She called Natan Sharansky, who called me. Right? She was sure it would happen. And the end of the day is, on all the pardon requests, there were one or two, most of them he turned down. Pollard, he left blank. Which means a sitting, theoretically speaking, it's an open book on President Obama's desk. Not on his desk, but in theory. It's an open book. And when people ask me, how come Bush didn't do it? He didn't pardon Scoop Libby, right? So what can you, what we, what, what we thought we had it. We had thousands of phone calls coming from Jews all over the country. We closed down, we, Klai Yisrael, closed down that White House switchboard with calls coming in. They had a high, we know from the inside they had to put new phone lines in so the East Wing could call the West Wing. Or West Wing, whatever it was, right? We know people called up. I want to talk about Polly. Yeah, we know. The operator knew the story better than anybody else did. We thought we had it. Klal Yisrael. There are Chadorim and Lakewood starting their morning out with a capital to Hillam for Jonathan Pollard. Right? There were yeshivas that were letting their high school boys go to the office in the afternoon to call the White House. I told Jonathan, you may not have gotten out. But the achdus that you created between reform and conservative and orthodox and yeshivish and chassidish, right? That's chus is somewhere waiting to be used. And our bracha and our tefillah is, that's chus of unity and tefillah and achdus and concern. HaKadosh Baruch Hu should take that chus and use it for your honus and bamalka b'mheiwa b'yameinu amen. Amen.